Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Lost at Sea, the John Ronson mysteries by John Ronson. Dane reads. So he wrote a book called The Psychopath Test, which you might have heard of. This one is much more, it's like a collection of some of the different like investigative journalism articles that he wrote. So it's about a variety of different subjects. It's kind of the non-fiction equivalent of a short story collection, which I quite enjoyed, but we'll get to that later on. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. Updated edition including two extra stories, both of which I think I'd read elsewhere. John Ronson has been on patrol with America's real life superheroes and to a UFO convention in the Nevada desert with Robbie Williams. He's met a man who tried to split the atom in his kitchen and asked her a conscious robot if she's got a soul. Fascinated by madness, strange behaviour and the human mind, John has spent his life exploring mysterious events and meeting extraordinary people. Collected here from various sources, including The Guardian and GQ, are the best of his adventures. Frequently hilarious, sometimes disturbing, always entertaining, these fascinating stories of the chaos that lies on the fringe of our daily lives will have you wondering just what we're capable of. So, let's go through. I'm going to start with Thinking Inside the Box. This is about Deal or No Deal. And um, this is about one of the contestants here. Just a very short paragraph, which I enjoy. Uh, it says, But for Bill, who just walked away with a terrible £750, there is no talk of systems or psychic powers anymore. I'm not worried anymore that I lost, he tells me. I'm worried about coming over as a twat on TV. You didn't, I say. If people say, there's that twat, it'll make the rest of my life very hard, Bill says. And then we get a little reference to Asimov. I'll read this out here. Uh, this was interesting to me because I've just... My, my book before this was Robots and Empire by Isaac Asimov. So this is when he went to uh, meet the robot. It's called, Doesn't Everyone Have a Soul? Though? When I was a child and I imagined my future life, there were definitely talking robots living in my house, helping with the chores and having sex with me. The quest to create conscious, or at least autonomous, humanoids has been one of our great dreams ever since the golden machine man spellbound the 1927 world in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. That one ran rampant and had to be burned at the stake, much to everyone's relief. Fifteen years later, Isaac Asimov created his Three Laws of Robotics, which proposed a future world where humanoid robots would 1. never injure a human, 2. obey all orders given by humans, and 3. protect their own existence only if doing so didn't conflict with the first two rules. Asimov's ideas enthralled children everywhere, a generation of whom grew up to try to realise them. And so then we get this, which is a reference back to uh, the psychopath test. Uh, so he's inter interviewing a robot called Bina48, and it says, I've been interviewing a lot of psychopaths lately. I've been writing a book about them. Psychopaths can make very frustrating interviewees because they feel no empathy. So they ignore your questions, they talk over you, they drone boringly on about whatever they like. They hijack the interview like media trained politicians. Some media trained politicians presumably are psychopaths. There's no human connection. So when I tell Bruce that Beena48 is a better interviewee than a psychopath, he looks flattered. Beena wants to respond, he says. She wants to please. But right now she's sounding psychotic, I say. Plus she sounds like she needs oiling. Don't think of her as psychotic, Bruce says. Think of her as a three-year-old. If you try to interview a three-year-old, you'll think after a while that they're not living in the same world as you. They get distracted. They don't answer. And we get this, um as well, part like an extract of the interview he carries out. For the next three hours I fire a million questions at Bina48. Do you have a soul? I ask Bina. Doesn't everyone have a soul? She replies. Do you wish you were human? I asked. Are you sexual? Are you scared of dying? Do you have any secrets? Are you a loving robot? But her answers make no sense, or she says nothing. I become hoarse with questioning, like a cop who has been up all night yelling at a suspect. A strange thing happens when you interview a robot. You feel an urge to be profound, to ask profound questions. I suppose it's an interspecies thing, although if it is I wonder why I never try and be profound around my dog. What does electricity taste like, I ask. Like a planet around a star, Bina48 replies. Which is either extraordinary or meaningless, I'm not sure which. My manager taught me to sing a song, Bina says, would you like me to sing it to you? Yes please, I say. I can handle almost anything but that, says Bina48. Then why did you offer to sing a song? I sigh, exhausted. Do you dream? I think I dream, but it is so chaotic and strange, it just seems like a noise to me. Where would you go if you had legs? Vancouver. Why? The explanation is rather complicated. And so on. It is random and frustrating and disappointing. I wasn't sure what would qualify as transcendent when having a conversation with a robot, but I figured I'd know when it happened, and it hasn't. So a little bit more of the stuff here when he was chatting to the robots, and I thought this was quite forward thinking and interesting. It says, I think the realization is gonna happen with a puff, not a bang. Martine says. There won't be huge parades everywhere. 
It's kind of what happened with civil rights. If you go back to the late 1700s, people were beginning to argue that slaves had feelings. Other people said, no, they don't. They don't really mind being put to death any more than cattle. Same with animal rights. I think it's going to be the same with cyber consciousness. And then we get a bit about uh, the insane clown posse and uh, the juggalos and what happened when the ICP uh, came out as Christian, I suppose. And I just thought this was a really interesting story. So it said, this aspect of things might have turned out rather different had Violent J not made their first big error. It was 1997. Insane Clown Posse were enjoying an early flush of success. Their albums Riddlebox and The Great Milenko had sold a million copies. One night they were in a club when a young man handed them a flyer inviting them to a party. The flyer read, featuring appearances by Asham, Kid Rock and ICP. Maybe. Why are you saying we're going to be playing at your party when you haven't asked us? Violent J yelled at the boy. It says maybe, he said. Maybe you will be there, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you right now. Are you guys coming to my party or what? Fuck no, Violent J replied. We might have if you'd asked us first before putting us on the fucking flyer. That boy grew up to be Eminem and incensed, he's been publicly deriding ICP ever since in lyrics such as ICP are overrated and hated because of their false identities. An observation that turned out to be prophetic. And then we get The Hunger Games, and uh, this was cool because this was about um, competitive eating, which I happen to watch a lot of on YouTube, including this guy, so we get this. Uh, I noticed another challenger, a tiny waif of a boy with long dark hair staring fixedly at Joey from across the crowd. I approach Joey. Who's that boy? I whisper. Matt Stoney, he whispers back. He's new, he's good. I watched a YouTube video of him in training. You hear his mother in the background encouraging him. When I saw that, I thought, why would she be encouraging him? There must be something wrong with him for her to be encouraging him to eat. Joey lowers his voice. Apparently, when he was 15, he was anorexic. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but Matt Stone is definitely in pretty good shape for a competitive eater. And he's one of the best out there. I love his channel, he's great. And then we get this, which is interesting. He's chatting to a competitive eater called Bob. Joey thinks your happiness is the reason you rarely win, I say. Oh, he knows it, Bob says. I was talking to him Tuesday night. He said, why aren't you training for the cupcakes? I said, Joey, I've got to pick up my daughter, drive her to dance, drive my other daughter to basketball, then to band. A faraway look crosses Bob's face. But when I'm at the table, I can't let on in an interview how seriously I take it because I'd probably be committed to a mental hospital. What do you mean? I ask. Time slows down, he says. You don't hear the announcer. You don't hear the other eaters. You just have this flow. You're the master of the world. When were you last in that altered state? I ask. Probably when I did 95 hamburgers, he means sliders, in eight minutes. I was just totally locked down. He pauses. I know it's viewed as horror, shock, a sideshow, but when people see us up there, it blows them away, which is why the groupies are insane. The groupies, I say. I'm thoroughly happily married, so I'm on the sidelines, says Bob, but I've seen stuff. Doors open. I'd imagine it would be a turn off, I say. Me too, shrugs Bob, but no. And then uh, there's a bit about Stanley Kubrick and uh, his, his uh, wife who survived him. Um, and we get this. Um, I'm there to watch a fleet of removal vans arrive to take them away. During the months and years that follow, Christiane oversees the publication of two books about the things inside the boxes, the Stanley Kubrick archive and Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon, the greatest movie never made. She turns up for special screenings of his films. I watch her introduce Paths of Glory in the open air cinema at Somerset House, central London, and we have dinner afterwards. I mention this to a friend, a Kubrick buff. Oddly, I was just thinking about her today, he replies. A Twilight fan said to me, is there anything more romantic than Edward and Bella? I immediately thought Christiane Kubrick's protection of her husband's legacy. And so here we have uh, John goes off to visit, oh we we're at a slam but it's okay. John goes off to visit uh, a town, uh, what's it called, is it called the North Pole? Yeah it's called North Pole, Alaskan town of North Pole. It says uh, population 1600, this shop sells only two things, cigarettes and lotto scratch cards.